I'm Andy Phillips, co-founder and managing partner of Make Home Capital. Um, and it is really lovely to see you all, some folks that I know, um, but also some new faces. Um, I'm here today with Dr. Candace Thomas, who has been a partner to Make Home in a great project, which is what we're going to spend most of our time talking about today, um, which is a pre-K project in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and Shelby County, Tennessee, which sort of overlaps, but not completely, um, and is a really exciting example of um, how outcomes financing um, was used in that context to really drive really, really strong financial and impact performance um, for the project. Um, I do want to do a little table setting first. Um, so how many people here know what a social impact bond is, pay for success, or outcomes financing? Wow, fantastic. How many people were at SOCAP in either 2012 or 2013? when it felt like all anybody wanted to talk about were social impact bonds. <laughs> Me. So I was here. Um, so just sort of turning back time a little bit to give context, the idea of the social impact bond, and I do air quotes because they're not bonds, and I was, my, uh, line was always that they were social impact, not a bonds. Um, anyway, at about that time was when that was social impact bonds and pay for success was a very, very new idea. And it emerged out of the UK where the incredible, brilliant, indomitable Sarani Cohen had this idea that um, we could think about impact investing as a tool to drive better outcomes in communities. And that fundamentally what we are, we're going to do was partner with government and use private capital as it has been used historically to build bridges and tunnels and airports in public-private partnerships, but instead to drive better outcomes for health and human services. Um, if you take a step back and think about it, government is the largest purchaser of services for people who are poor and disadvantaged to the tune of $800 billion to a $1 trillion a year. If any of you have ever heard me speak or some fellow travelers, we all talk about how there was at a given moment, deep consensus among Republicans and Democrats that only 1% of that spend was based on evidence. The core of the idea of what we now call outcomes financing was basically to disrupt government funding and business as usual. And the way I think about it is when government funds those programs, um, for people who are poor and disadvantaged, you essentially are creating a market failure because the per person who is buying the services government is not the person that is then using those services or the customer. And so what you end up with is no feedback from the customers into the system in terms of how those um, services are performing. Pre-K is a great example. If you're a private pre-K targeting private pre pay families and you're not providing really strong services, do you know what? Nobody enrolls in your program because they're not going to pay for it. When government is funding those programs, folks don't have the same level of choice if that's what they need. Um, so what, I, what we're going to do today is really talk about um, sort of social impact bonds 10 years later, but really doing it through the lens of this particular project in Memphis. And I've been coming to SOCAP for a long time. It is a sort of hotbed of ideas and the next big thing. As I said 10 years ago, social impact bonds were the next big thing, um, which is really, really fun in real life. Any new investment strategy takes a lot of hard work, and you have to move beyond the next big thingness of it. And so, what we want to do today is something a little bit different in this context, which is actually to talk about a real life investment, to talk about the impact performance, and to talk about the financial performance. Um, because 
from if I think about building new markets and leveraging impact investing dollars, um, to me, it is a very bottom-up process. And what I want to know is how is impact capital driving real impact in communities, and that the way we are going to build these markets and get to scale is, in some sense, one deal at a time. So today, we're going to talk about one deal. Um, as I said, I have the fabulous Dr. Candace Thomas here, um, who is the, what did I say, the heart, soul, and wisdom behind this <laughs> pre-K project. Um, it has been amazing uh, to work with her over the last three years and together um, in partnership be able to provide pre-K to 3,000 low-income four-year-olds in Memphis. I think when we started working together, it was April 2020, and if you ever thought there was a, that Candace was not fierce, she up and moved to Memphis a month into COVID <laughs> to lead this effort. And um, if you had asked me, would we be successful delivering pre-K during a global pandemic? Um, I would have been a little bit worried, but the exciting news is we were able to do it. So um, I am now going to sort of turn it to Can Candace and say, and really start with sort of a big picture question, which is, why pre-K? Like, why is this where you focus, but also why is this where Memphis and Shelby County focused? Yeah. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, move over. So, you can, so we can see your face and you can see ours. Um, I'm a New Yorker, so Andy and I were just talking and we're talking about how in Memphis things are, move a little slower. And I, want, I like things to move a little faster and I have a lot of head nods and a lot of gestures, so you, you're gonna see a lot of that. And in Memphis I have to do a lot of like cultural attuning, like, okay, slow down. Oh, they're gonna they're they're gonna say they're gonna say you're aggressive. <laughs> so it's so interesting for me. I'm constantly like thinking about cultural context and landscapes. Um, so um, I am a developmental scientist. So I study child development. I've been focused on children pre um, starting prenatally for 16 years now. And so pre-K is, um, is a no-brainer for someone like me, knowing that children are literally born learning, and we can argue that children in utero are learning. Um, and so our system, starting at birth, really is a hodgepodge of many different things. But pre-K in this country has really been a fast-moving train really since the 1970s, um, when some of the first pre-K and, and preschool research projects occurred, mostly in Michigan and North Carolina. And so, in, and so it's really a no-brainer. We know we need to invest in young kids' education. We know that parents and families and caregivers want to send their children to a place where they're having lots of fun and where they're learning a lot. Um, in Memphis and in Tennessee, every state is different. Tennessee is a voluntary pre-K state, so you don't have to send your child to school until they're five. But we know that the higher quality environment for a young child, and high quality means a loving, nurturing caregiver who's going to talk to them all day and make sure they get their naps, right? Um, much more complicated than that, but high quality, making sure that children are with people who really care about them and who are gonna let them explore and have fun. And so in Tennessee, given that pre-K is voluntary, we saw a vast variety of different quality of programs and services. And um, while they were, there were state investments, only less than 20% of people who were eligible for pre-K, so income eligible, were attending. So during the Obama administration, there was a huge push around the country for a preschool development block grant. It's actually, it's been several iterations since, and it's up for renewal now. And so Memphis, which is in West Tennessee, and the, the county is Shelby, applied, and uh, the community had about 1,000 more pre-K seats. And then the, they did not get the grant the second go round. So then Memphis and Shelby County were gonna lose all of those pre-K seats. And my colleagues were really having a hard time figuring out how do we convince local government that not only can we not lose these seats, 
we need way more pre-K seats in the community. And so the story is that um, our local government said, well, we're not going to just pay for this to pay for it. So our colleague um, in Memphis, Mark Sturgis, said, well, you're not going to pay for it just to pay for it. You'll pay for outcomes. Um, now, if I were in the picture at that point, I probably would have argued there have been, there's been research for the past 30 years proving that pre-K works, especially for kids who look just like the kids in Memphis. So why are we doing this? But it convinced our local government. And so we started a three years outcomes financing program for pre-K in our community. And it made Memphis, the city of Memphis and our local county the only city and county in Tennessee with universal needs-based pre-K for every child who needs it. Great, thank you. Um, and so um, at about the time when they were about to lose the pre-K seats was when our team at Maycomb met the folks um, down in Memphis and began uh, working together around the outcomes financing project. Together what we came up with was what were the key outcomes that folks really cared about. And where we started was consistent attendance. Um, there's a tremendous amount of research that shows that consistent attendance is correlated um, with long-term academic success. As Candace points out, pre-K is voluntary. But the idea was if you could get families to build that consistent attendance muscle early on, that that would ultimately lead to um, a better attendance track record. Um, in this, the second two metrics were really tied to data that was already being collected in the community. So they were already using a pre-K um, literacy skills assessment tool that was a standardized assessment tool. So we used that. And then the third metric was around kindergarten readiness. So all kids in Shelby County schools get assessed based on a normed uh, test at the beginning of the year around kindergarten readiness, um, and that was our, um, our third metric. We launched the project in the fall of 2019. Things were going incredibly well, really strong, consistent attendance. Um, really strong enrollment, which isn't always a given when it's a voluntary program. And then it was March 2020, and COVID hit. And um, we all had to collectively manage through that. So I think, Candace, I'm going to turn it to you and sort of hear a little from your perspective in terms of what was going on on the ground when you arrived in Memphis. <laughs> So you can imagine March of 2020, right? We all had this collective experience of, hold on, what is happening? Many of us had to stay home and had the privilege of staying home because you know not every single worker in our economy could have stayed home. And so you had a bunch of young kids at home um, and obviously older children as well. So what a complete flip. Um, at that time, every single one of our classrooms went virtual. Um, the end of the school year, that school year, and most of our classrooms, um, actually 100% were virtual the next school year um, until about April of 2021. And so, as Andy said, we were tracking attendance and enrollment and kindergarten readiness. And then you were like, wait a minute, these babies, these four-year-olds had to zoom into school or, or virtually connect to school. How do we do that? We know young kids learn in the presence of someone older, an older child, a cousin, an adult, or a caregiver. So then we said, oh, we need to start tracking how often do teachers actually are live Zooming with their four-year-old classrooms. So then we started tracking synchronous learning. And then we really thought, What's most important here is not about, our, not about their kindergarten readiness and those scores. How do we make sure families, especially the families that need it most, have additional support? So we really started to track wraparound services, making sure that there was a family engagement worker or someone really touching base with every single family in our program. So that was a huge game changer. And then we obviously started tracking some social emotional developmental goals that we, or just wanted to see where kids were. Cause you know, if you ask people to collect the data, then they actually have to do it. And so we had to start asking them to collect certain data so that we really understand, 
understood where kids were. And I think what I would posit is that the structure of outcomes financing, where dollars were going to flow based on actually achieving outcomes, provided a framework and scaffolding for the partners to, um, over the summer of, I guess it was 2020, really come together across us as the private investors, the folks at First Aid, the providers, the folks in government, and say, OK, the unheard of has happened. We are now faced, as Candace said, with teaching four-year-olds virtually. What are we going to hold ourselves accountable in terms of delivering to these kids? And I don't know if any of you guys had kids in school during COVID. I had a high school student, and I'd go in his room at 11 in the morning, and he'd be in bed asleep. And I'd be like, what's going on? And he'd roll over and say, asynchronous. <laughs> and it was never planned. It was impossible to know if that was true or not. Well, you can't do that. You could manage it if you were in high school, but not if you're four years old and not if you're a mom or a dad home with a four-year-old. And so I think what we saw in terms of the collaboration on the ground was how do we come together and agree on what are the standards we're going to hold ourselves to? And I think one of the leaps forward was it forced us to think really about what are the building blocks that we know we need to deliver to these family and hold ourselves accountable to, and ultimately continue to track pre-K literacy skills and kindergarten readiness. Um, and so from our perspective, and I, as I said, have been doing this work a really long time, I think it helped me sort of, uh, it helps solidify for me the thesis that the structure of outcomes financing actually does lead to better outcomes, which then I'm going to pivot to Candace and let her talk about sort of what we found out and where we ended up during a very, very trying times. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say, again, like having this structure in place really forced us to do a really good job of keeping track of our assessments and our outcomes. And then obviously um, from this project, this project involved both the city of Memphis, so the city council, and the local county commission. And so we were also then reporting out, and today actually my colleague had a presentation in front of the city council, reporting quarterly to the city council and the, co and the county commission about what was happening. So we had all of these structures in place to make sure that we were holding ourselves accountable as much as we were holding every single teacher and family service, um, family engagement person accountable to the work. Um, you know, Everyone is incredible and through this global pandemic, but we got to celebrate the four-year-olds and especially those four-year-olds in Memphis. We saw that our four-year-olds who were, we ensured that they intentionally received wraparound services, and sometimes we think this was the secret sauce about our program, that they had really strong pre-K reading skills um, during that COVID year and um, there was some data that also indicated that they were ready for kindergarten when they got to kindergarten the next year. The data is a little bit wonky because if you remember September of 2020, everyone's at home. And so we had to like have families reassess because we think the first assessment that we had some parents or older siblings taking some tests for our four-year-olds. So when they got back into the classroom in April, we had, unfortunately, because it's never, it's never good to overassess any of us, but especially kids, um, we had to, we did some additional assessments to really see where they were. And we had some really strong kindergarten readiness outcomes. Um, and after, uh, for in September 2021, that data was consistent. So 45% of children in our pre-K program, which is a subset, about 20% of Memphis's pre-K students overall were kindergarten ready. That is huge. Andy always compares that to Kentucky data. Yes, yeah, so I don't get our friends in, Mem in, in Tennessee angry with us. But if you look at the similar population data for low-income 
kids in Kentucky, it's 35%. And that's pretty consistent with national data, that typically in low-income communities, 30 to 35% of kids are enter entering kindergarten, kindergarten ready. 45% of our kids were there. Without getting into the statistics of it, you would expect on a population basis to have 50% of kids being kindergarten ready because it's a norm test. What that means is we were able to significantly close the achievement gap for kids coming in. Mm -hmm. And again, like I want to take a moment on that during COVID. And so when we think about sort of impact investing and where are our dollars going, I think one of the exciting things about the structure of our investments is that there is not a trade-off between re financial return and impact. Those things move together. So this investment from a financial per perspective performed as we expected it to, and from an impact perspective, it performed, I think what I would say is better than we anticipated it would, because I don't, while we expect it to begin to close the achievement gap, I don't think we expect it to get this far. And what I would say is I think it is a, really a testament to the amazing folks on the ground. Um, but I also think this structure of outcomes financing is really part of uh, that story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it creates the infrastructure needed for us to be successful. Yeah. Um, so how do you see this work continuing? So you just said that folks are now continuing to report on outcomes mm -hmm. to the city and county council. Is the notion here that this is now a muscle that's been built in Memphis and Shelby County that will continue to hold folk, folks accountable for those outcomes? Absolutely. So we're continuing the work um, and you know, we'll continue to partner with Maycomb and um, our other stakeholders in one way or another, but we're just seeing it instead of outcomes financing, a performance-based pre-K program. So we want to, this was, this really laid the groundwork for us to put in the infrastructure needed to collect the data. And so we are continuing with that. We're, co we're continuing to collect all the data that we did um, over the last three years through outcomes financing, continuing to report out to our local stakeholders because we want, we know with the data that that may, that'll help improve our programs. Parents will understand better what they can expect from their young, from a, from a high quality pre-K experience, what their young child can be learning. And so this is going to continue just without the outcomes financing arm of it. And that's really the idea is that this is a way of pivoting what's happening on the ground. I'm going to pause here and open up for questions, because I think these are always more interesting if we can have a dialogue. So any questions? And so you're asking about how did the children in our program actually connect? OK, so remember that time of our lives and um, just trying to figure out um, how do we ensure in a mostly low-income working class community and city um, that four-year-olds would have access. The technology companies came with an amazing commitment to ensuring that everyone had access. So it didn't, we don't have broadband, which I think we need, but we did ensure that with through Verizon and um, AT&T, we actually applied for a grant with the state of Tennessee. The technology companies work with the state of Tennessee, and so First State Memphis and our local, pre, uh, our local school district, which is the largest school district in Tennessee, applied for a grant, and we um, actually got hot spots for every single family and or if the family needed a tablet or a computer. So as you may know, there are like tablets on the market that were that you literally can just use to get into school. So we we got all of those grants in the community, and that is how a literal labor of love getting thousands of hotspots and tablets across Memphis during the height of COVID. But it happened. <laughs> One of the things we also talked a lot about was 
for all of these families that might otherwise not have been connected to some of the systems that would help them, the wraparound support providers and first aid became really critical lifelines in terms of making sure someone was checking in with families, getting them access to these resources, and your team did an amazing job on the ground um, when everybody was living life disrupted. So really incredible. Memphis really benefits from a very uh, strong organization on the ground called Seeding Success that is uh, focused on uh, better outcomes cradle to career for people living in Memphis. Memphis has, I think, the second highest child poverty rate in the country. Um, and the team at Seeding Success were really the lead on building support with the city and county to get them on board. Um, as context that I think is also really interesting in this project, um, cities and counties don't often collaborate in the US. And so it is really innovative and speaks well of the partnerships on the ground that they will, were able to leverage and pool funding from both the city and the county. Um, from, on a technical basis, they passed a joint ordinance that put in place the commitment, and then they each passed their own budget and then contracted jointly, um, and which really was, a, a, you know, really kudos to them that they were willing to collaborate in that way. And I, you know, you should add to this, but I think that part of, again, this structure of outcomes financing meant everybody was already at the table. We were already holding quarterly project meetings. On a quarterly basis, the team on the ground was already reporting to the city council and the county council. And so when COVID hit, those relationships existed, and they were then part of the com uh, conversation. Um, and something like this, and with a lot of other projects, requires ongoing relationship building, right? And leadership changes. So we just got, for instance, a new director of education at the county level. And so now we need to bring this person up to speed and constantly in front of him so that he understands our where we've been and where we're trying to go. Um, so there's been lots of, there's like ongoing relationship building with, with both sides, the city and the county. Um, and also just... You know, when you're running, when you're in the city government, you're running a gazillion and 15 projects. And so constantly, like, not only annually getting in front of both um, chiefs of staff and maybe um, CAOs, the, um, I'm, I'm forgetting, administrative officer, thank you. I was like, cannot think what a CAO is at the moment. But on both sides and bringing them together and reminding them where we've been, what does our data look like, and how we need their ongoing support and why it's so important. At this point, people should not vote against the babies. So we just were up for renewal for our three-year contract. And there was and there is still some rhetoric in Tennessee around children should be at home with their mothers until they're five. And so we're still needing to do a lot of advocacy and educating around um, child care, the needs of young families with young children, et cetera. So it is just, it really is ongoing boots to the ground that both I have to do, some members of my team, but also our local early childhood policy and advocacy folks. Just to walk through how the investment is structured, thank you for asking, Jay. Um, we at Make Home provide the upfront capital to first aid in the form of a loan. Um, with some unique features, which I'll talk about in a minute. So we lend them the money to actually deliver the services. The repayment for the loan comes based on the contract with the city and the county that are tied to the outcomes that we've been talking about. Um, our investment is a pretty vanilla sort of term loan where we fund in multiple tranches because we want our capital um, to be efficient for the project. Um, the unique feature is that we do share in the risk of project success so that if the project falls short of the outcomes, uh, we would then take that loss rather than first aid. Um, and so again, it's not unlike investing 
in building LaGuardia Airport in our home city of New York, or my now home city, your former home city, um, where investors have put up the initial capital and they'll get repaid over time as that airport is in use. We hold ourselves to a little bit higher of a standard. We have to hit the outcomes rather than just be in use. And there are still questions about whether or not LaGuardia Airport will provide high quality service. If anybody's it flown through New York, though. it does look better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so philosophically, I actually really struggled with it when I learned about it, right? Because of what you just said, that I'm putting a, a dollar value on how much a child is learning in a four-year-old is learning in pre-K, knowing that especially that children learn best in the context of really strong relationships. Um, and then also the fact that this was a financing model that, um, you know, that was coming from the outside, knowing how important Memphis, um, how much Memphis focuses on, and as an outsider, I know about um, folks who are from there, people who are investing, who understand the cultural context of Memphis as a community historically and present day. Um, and also the fact that in the United States, we constantly over-research and over-assess, especially black, black and brown communities. So all of those things I struggled with mightily. Um, as I, um, and I still struggle with all of those things. I do know, however, that there are, all of that context does play into the fact that the city and the county um, was, was not able to and did not allocate funding for education, for pre-K education until this effort, right? So we know all the context also, right? I hope, and we didn't say yet, but I don't know if it's clear that Memphis is 65% black. Black American, some um, folks from across the, the diaspora, but mostly Black American, in a city that was founded um, because it was like this incredible location for the American slave trade, right? So um, I think it's incredible to live in a mostly Black community. I've never done so in my whole life. So to me, it's, it's incredible. But all of that context comes into play here. Um, and we also, we live in this society. We have to strategize and figure out what's going to make the most sense. And it made a lot of sense for our colleagues to say, OK, there are many reasons why you're not investing in pre-K. We have another innovative strategy. And if this is what it's going to be to convince you, then we're going to do it. So I'll still struggle with some of the philosophical approaches to all of this, especially in the context of Memphis. But we also know the reality in which we live. And if this is what it took, and our um, city and county government said, OK, we want to partner with Maycomb and a, our, our, a local funder, to, and we want to see outcomes. And this is what it was going to take for them to do it then let's get it done. So I think I would just share, add a couple of things to that. It, it is something that we're very, very aware of. And I think we try and manage that tension um, by building strong relationships on the ground, predating Candace. I spent a lot of time with the founding board of First Aid, which is it has some interesting folks on it. Uh, the chair is a leading businesswoman um, in Memphis who I think was re has been really helpful along the way mm -hmm. of helping be a bridge person, as well as another board member who ran procurement for FedEx. Um, so she had her like smart government procurement hat on and really also was a, a helpful advocate early on in terms of helping, again, uh, be folks who are a bridge. Another strategy that we use um, is to typically find a local co-investor. And that, that's really somebody who is of the community and who can be a voice in all the conversations that is aligned with us from an investment perspective, but really understands the community. And that, I think, was has always been really invaluable. Local philanthropy came in, and we provided the lion's share of the capital, but they provided um, some of that. And so I think that uh, is something that helped. I think we also tried really hard to stay in our lane. And it's funny, when we've done these deals in other places, people will say to us, well, 
do you decide on the outcomes? And what we always say is, no, you decide on the outcomes. We're not coming in and saying, use this assessment tool. This is the right thing to track. But instead, it's looking to what's already being done. Because those are value decisions that communities are making. Mm -hmm. And particularly when it comes to early childhood assessments, like the academic community in early childhood, they would kill each other over choosing different assessment tools. And yes. there is no answer. We believe the answer is whatever local folks have decided to use. So wrap around Andy, right? It was built into the program. So that was a and that was built into the program as they were starting it. And that that's a sort it's not really new to early childhood. Uh, if you know anything about Head Start, Head Start is um, federal um, pre-K essentially. You can characterize it that way. And wrap around is a key part of that. Um, so we they were in person wrap around and then the height of COVID, we were virtual wraparound. And so that stayed consistent. But you know, it was hard for every single one of us to adjust to a, a virtual environment. Um, people were doing a little door-to-door -door canvassing. Um, in a low-end community, there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of instability around housing and, um, and in Memphis transportation. So there was a lot of um, just rethinking how do, we how do we make sure that we're accessing families and getting them what they need. So there was a lot of figuring out where families are and especially as the economic situation was changing, like where people were moving to. So there was just a ton of activity on the ground. Um, and actually, no, we actually saw some savings. You can call it savings. We actually call it unused funds, right? So we saw folks were using less money in their budget during the height of the, the year and a half of COVID when people were mostly at home because there weren't, you know, we weren't going to conferences. We weren't taking, um, schools weren't taking field trips, et cetera. So we actually, we didn't have to adjust our budget for some of the other needs. We actually saw that our programs were using less and less. That and then I think importantly, my recollection is you were able to then invest that money where it made sense in terms of some focus on social emotional learning and professional development. Right. So thank you, Andy. So we used some of what we didn't spend in the year prior. We actually instituted a, a, a better assessment, in my opinion, um, that not only assessed kids' reading skills, but assessed them across all developmental domains. So how were they social emotionally? Where were they physically in their growth, right? Because we can tell what that something is happening with the child um, based on their the, um, how they're growing and, and, and what landmarks they were meeting. And so we, if you're familiar with this, we instituted Brigance, which is an assessment tool that um, assesses kids through observation. So that means you have to be paying attention to them um, across seven developmental domains. But to train and lift 80 classrooms in Brigance on our end, and then our all of our um, pre-K classrooms in the community in Memphis was a big lift. So we were able to reinvest those unused funds into other things. And what I would say is the advantage of outcomes financing because it's unlike a cost reimbursement contract, which is the way government contracts typically work, there was flexibility in terms of redeploying the resources in a way that we're going to continue to drive strong outcomes um, yeah. rather than, oh, we're just going to give that back to the city and the county. Right. And that's such a strong point with government investment. So we were able to uphold that in our next contract with the city and county. So it's not um, reimbursement, it's we get paid up front and then we um, quarterly report out on where we are with the funding and if we have unused funds, how we're gonna reinvest that back into the community. So that was a really strong model for us to uphold. So it is a really interesting question and having been involved in this work early on, which in most cases really grew out of the first projects were all in the criminal justice system where everybody loved the argument of don't put someone in prison for a year where it costs two hundred thousand dollars spend x thousand dollars to keep them out of jail and that was like catnip right that idea everybody loved it um 
And it's interesting what has happened in the US. There's a, a person who's here today, if you can find him, Ben McAdams, who was really the one of the first movers, um, headed up county government in Salt Lake County. Um, and I think he said it best, which was government should not be in the business of saving money. We should hold ourselves accountable to improving people's lives and our community. And that really clicked for me. And so we at Make Home have really tried to move away from the cost savings argument and really focus on value. I think it also, from our perspective, um, has felt reductive and is not something we're, we want to do. We want to talk about how it is worth investing in pre-K because that is the building block of a strong Memphis which has a skilled workforce and that's why you do it and it's the right thing to do for these kids or when we talk about employment and training programs that is what that is good smart economic development because you're creating a talent pipeline for businesses coming in so we've tr really tried to move away from that argument Though it's hard, and I think particularly in the US context, when you end up in very red states, because I think that is something that resonates. But we've tried to move away from it, and we've also tried to move away from the first investment I made when I was at Goldman Sachs doing this work early on was in a criminal justice project, and it was all about um, you know, cost savings. And it, so it was about reducing recidivism and like shrinking the jail population. And that is an incredibly negative metric, right? And so we've also tried to hold ourselves accountable to positive metrics, right? Let's talk about what happened to those young people who were in jail when they left as a result of what they were doing, rather than just saying, oh, we've saved the system money. Mm -hmm. But it's hard, we live in a political world and people have political beliefs. What we've also tried to get away from, though, that I think is very important is early on in the US, there was probably six to 12 months taken before any project was started trying to calculate to the penny the potential cost savings. And we've really moved away from that because in real life, government is going to put aside an amount of money. And it's never, you know, Let's talk about pre-K. Someone, Jim Heckman won a Nobel Prize saying that there is a seven to one payoff in the US for investing in early childhood. I can assure you, we did not earn a 7x return. <laughs> and the county and city were not going to pay us that. So given that, I think, you, we do, I think you're right. In the background, folks are doing a cost-benefit analysis. But let's not waste time and resources, and most importantly, a year of not delivering pre-K to at-risk or kids who need it, calculating to the penny what the cost savings are. So um, I think we are over time. So with that, thank you, everybody, for your interest. Thank you, Candace, for thank making you. the trek out here and being an amazing partner.